Hi, everyone. Welcome to DAZER experiment number three. I'm J.D. Tolosic. I'm the Director of Cultural Programs of the National Academy of Sciences, and I'm so glad that you could join us today. So what is a DAZER? DC Art Science Evening Rendezvous, or DAZER, is a series of cross-disciplinary salons uh, that we've been hosting at the NAS for almost 10 years now. Uh, and they have the intent of bringing people from different communities into a conversation to foster a general spirit of collaboration and integrative thinking. How can different disciplines inform one another? Can this lead uh, to innovative thoughts uh, that can impact both science as well as the arts? Our dazers, which geographically are based in Washington, D.C., are joined by a larger international network organized by Leonardo, the International Society of Art, Science, and Technology. And this network now consists of almost 50 similar groups uh, around the world, from Canada to Brazil, and from California to Singapore and Tehran. And we hope that our colleagues around the world are joining us now. Uh, we, we call these events uh, evening rendezvous because before the pandemic, uh, they occurred in the evening. Uh, we're hosting this at noon on the East Coast in the hopes that maybe our West Coast colleagues can join us for coffee or our colleagues in Europe and beyond could join us for cocktails perhaps. So how do we take a physical experience such as a Dazer and bring it online? Like most programming uh, done uh, during the pandemic, uh, we're all trying to figure this out and experiment with what works. Uh, to see if we can continue to spark similar conversations in a virtual space that we did in a physical one. You can see our past uh, days or experiments online, as well as the past uh, nine plus years of archives on our CPNAS YouTube channel. But today for our, our days or experiment number three, we want to make a bit of a different approach. We want to tell you a story. One of an artist residency, uh, at a field station in California, the Sage Hen Creek Field Station. The origins of this residency could be tracked back to the recommendations of the Academy report. Now, the National Academy of Sciences has been advising Congress and the public on issues of science since Abraham Lincoln uh, in the Civil War. And it does so now as it did back then through developing reports written by experts on a range of subjects. And all of the reports from the Academy can be viewed free and online uh, at the National Academies Press uh, website. So the story that we are telling today is how an Academy report fostered an artist residency and why this is an interesting thought to investigate. We have four people here today to help us uh, tell this story. We have Jeff Brown and Farthen Felix who have been uh, the co-directors at the uh, field station at Sage Hen Creek and their collaborator from the center for Art and Environment from the Nevada Museum of Art, William Fox. We also are joined by Peter McCartney, who's the Director of the Division of Biological Infrastructure at the National Science Foundation, and he will help shed some light on how and why the report came about. So before we begin, a few, few logistics. The first part of today's program, as you'll see, is pre-recorded. Uh, but while you are watching it, uh, our, our guests are actually in the virtual green room and they can begin taking questions at any point. As a, as a thought comes up, uh, maybe you can go ahead and, and enter that question uh, using the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. Um, we'll come on live uh, after the, the, the recording and uh, continue the discussion in real time. Um, we are also going to use the chat function for what we call community share. Uh, when we host Dazers, uh, when we used to host them live, we used to have a community share time where people could take the microphone and introduce themselves and share their, um, their work uh, that's integrative or collaborative, and maybe even do a shout out uh, for potential collaborators. We're going to use the chat function to do that here and now. So at any point, introduce yourself. Let us know who you are and where you're calling from and what you're up to. Uh, so we'll, we'll look forward to uh, sharing that. So to recap, Q&A is for questions and chat is for community share. So let's get started. So my name is Jeff Brown and my official title is director of the University of California at Berkeley Central Sierra Field Research Stations, which are located in the Central Sierras. And 
I think what makes sense is to let's figure out where we are and what, what we are. Um, and that might help set the stage for what we're going to talk about as this day progresses. So let's go back to the late 1940s. when the California legislature thought it a good idea that the University of California have a wildlife and fisheries program at the university. Back then, the university was just one campus. So they approached the Berkeley campus. And of course, Berkeley was interested. And there were two folks there. Uh, one guy named was Paul Needham, who was a benthic macroinvert guy, so a guy who studies the bugs that live in creeks. And the other one was a guy named Starker Leopold. And the two of them thought that in addition to having the standard campus-based program, they wanted to find a place to do stuff. And the kind of stuff they wanted to do was pretty interesting. They, they were looking for a small creek that ran in the summer and they wanted to be able to dam off sections of the creek, divert the flow out of the main channel, pump the sections dry so they could see what lived in a creek. And somehow in their exploring of the Sierras, they found Sage End Creek Field Station. And in the winter of 1950-51, they skied out here with some representatives of the Forest Service and members of the California legislature. And that was when the Sage End Creek Field Station was begun. So the first, 10 years of sage hen was basically looking at freshwater fish. And the pumping and draining was what they did. Well, over time, uh, sage hen, you know, has done a lot of things. We are embedded within a forest. And this forest is like most of the forests in the Central Sierras. It had pretty much been managed by the Native Americans for thousands of years. And then when the Europeans arrived and took over, um, they pretty much clear cut the place um, and use it as a commodity. And early on for Farthen and I, the assistant manager here, so first of all, we're not academics. And when we arrived at Sage Hen, we really weren't sure uh, what we had landed on or in. And we struggled with what we really should be trying to do here at the field station. And since we are permittees with the Forest Service, you know, we, have a, we had a series of meetings with them and we realized that land managers really didn't have as much information, good scientific based information from which to make their decisions. And we thought, well, maybe one of the things Sagen could do would be to provide science to help them make better decisions or at least better informed um, decisions. So that's kind of how we started moving the trajectory here at Sagen. We think that what's going on here at this field station is pretty cool. And what's been really frustrating to us is how difficult it is to engage with broader audiences. In other words, we're really good at communicating with our choir, those that we associate with and look and believe and feel like we do. But how do you take what you're doing and use it to connect more broadly with the public as an example, or elected officials, or agency personnel, or students, or K-12 students. And fortunately, the National Science Foundation worked with the National Academies to do a report on field stations and marine labs to help us maybe think differently about what we were going to do to be relevant, which became a key issue for us. So when we re read this report that was published, it said that we were doing some things well and some things poorly. And what really made things crystal clear to us was this graph that was shared with us by Jerry Schubel, who's the executive director for the Long Beach Aquarium. And Jerry uses this graph, which is a five-step graph five step process getting to change. And first step is data. So you collect data, yeah, field station, science, good at that. So Second step is knowledge. So you take the data that you've collected and you convert it into some form of knowledge. And then to get to the important step, which is to change policy, you need step three, which is to create an empathetic connection. And science was specifically designed to pull emotion out. And so you can see why we have a problem. <laughs> because if we're really going to get people interested and excited, we got to grab them by the heart. I mean, we get a present things in a way that they can emotionally connect to. And that was how the whole arts conversation started. Is like, okay, how do we 
connect with this field, this discipline that we're really pretty clueless about. And then there's this museum down the hill from us in Nevada, in Reno, called the Nevada Museum of Art. And they're really interesting in that they have this thing called the Center for Art Plus Environment. And they're, they're pretty big thinkers. I mean, they're kind of on the leading edge of this internationally. And they had approached Sage Hen with the idea of commissioning a 50-year art project. Newton Harrison uh, and Helen Harrison um, were senior artists, retired from uh, UC San Diego uh, up to UC Santa Cruz, kind of were emeriti professors. And um, my colleague, Ann Wolf, a curator uh, at the museum here in Reno, said, why don't you call up the Harrisons? They once did a project uh, for the museum that looked at the Sierra Nevada as a unit as a geophysical unit and as a provider of water to all of uh, Central California. Um, why, don't, why don't you uh, call them up and see if they'd like to engage once again with the Sierra Nevada? And I said, that's a wonderful idea. And, uh, and they said, we'd like to come to Reno and we would like to um, talk to you about this. They had a proposal that would uh, look at the 400 mile long range of the Sierra Nevada and propose experimental ensembles of plants in the face of rising temperatures and in, in the mountain range. Those plants would uh, survive the rising temperature, control erosion from melting snow and increasingly rain instead of snow in the Sierra uh, as a source of precipitation. Um, and it would just be healthier overall. The Sierra has been hot many times and plants have moved up the chain to the top of the peaks and they've disappeared, they've boiled off, so to speak. And, um, and what comes in to, you know, to fill the gap left behind, in history, that's been a slow process pretty much. And plants have come in that have been beneficial and it's kind of been an orderly succession, if you like. Um, nowadays, that's not what's happening. As, as the species climb up, uh, the gaps are being filled by weedy species. Uh, the lines of orderly succession of plants have been broken. And so what's coming in is stuff that burns fast um, and that does not help control erosion. In fact, increases, you know, kind of the, the particulate pollution of water flowing off the mountains. This is not good for anybody who lives in, in Southern California. They started looking for a place where they could plant these plots. And we ended up at Seichen because Jeff and Fartham were already on this track uh, through looking at what David Robertson from the uh, literature and environment program at UC Davis was doing, for example. So they said, sure, come on in. And we were stunned. I mean, there was no resistance. You know, there are people, they always say yes. They never say no. Sometimes how you get to the yes is going to have to be negotiated. And that was a process with the Harrisons about well, what kind of plants can you bring in here? You can't bring in species from Siberia. So what kind of species can there be? Where can they be planted? How many plots can we establish and so forth? And they started this 50-year art project by actually putting the ensembles of plants that were approved by the scientists in these plots at different elevations and in different places. And the art that comes out of what looks like a science project are the maps and the, the poetry that they use to describe what they're doing. And these things are shown in museums around the world. Um, so you reach an entirely new audience that had never heard of Seichen before, had never heard of the idea of succession of plants, didn't have any idea that correlated to the quality of water you're drinking. So it was really a wonderful, uh, a wonderful success. And uh, the results were shown in New York uh, multiple times and, and of course in Reno and, and in other venues. When we first arrived at Sage in 2001, we, you know, we weren't really sure what we should be doing, but um, we talked to the community about some of their needs for in the science world. And uh, we were doing some really good work um, uh, pushing forest management issues. Um, we were really excited that we're making some really serious progress with the science. And then um, because of that, the Forest Service came to us in 2004 and said, okay, it's our centennial year. And what we would like to do is um, create an, an experimental forest at Sage Hen, designate you as an experimental forest. And what that would have done practically is um, change the management authority from the, re from the management side of the forest to the research side of the forest, which nobody knows about. But what that does is kind of secure the future here. So somebody can't come in, say, and put in a strip mine without considering the you know, the effect on the science, which is not the case in the multiple use national forest system. So we were really excited and we said yes. And so we went ahead and did, went through that process and Sage became the, the first experimental forest in 40 years. 
And um, one thing that was different about it is most experimental forests in the system are about increasing growth and yield. That's obviously not what we were doing here. So we, we made this, say, this experimental forest about um, understanding the ecosystem and restoring as much natural function as possible so that we can study a system like that. We have a data set that's, you know, 70 years old and it's, uh, there are not a lot of places in the world really and in the country certainly where you can actually have that kind of background information. So we were psyched. I mean, this, this secured that legacy going out in the future. And we thought we'd really hit it out of the park. And then one day we were wandering down the road. We ran into the Forest Service archeologist who was out in the field. And we started talking about, you know, how exciting it was that, that we're now on experimental forest. And she said, yeah, you know, I thought so too. And then I was at a party the other day and all the people there, you know, I was telling them about this and I was all excited and animated. And they said, well, I mean, I guess it's okay. You know, I seems kind of elitist, you know, basically what's in it for me. And, and she was shocked. And she said, you know, when she told us that we were shocked. I mean, we just didn't really know what to think. It was like, that's really strange. We have made these huge scientific achievements and accomplishments and, and um, nobody cares. And so we, uh, that really set us on a new course in 2004. And the one, when we first arrived, there was a class that had been coming here actually from UC Davis. And it was David Robertson's art and the art and environment course. And it was a really interesting course. It was kind of quirky and odd and we didn't really know what to think about it. It was about half science students and half um, art students. And they would all come out here and they would do, uh, you know, a little of each and wander around and approach problems from a different perspective. And it really got us kind of thinking. It's like, huh, this is really different. So when the uh, experimental forest issue came, came along, we, we started focusing more on some of our outreach programs. And we started getting school kids in here in a big way and you know different things and that helped some of the community relationships but we felt like we were still kind of missing the boat because you know when you're dealing with this socio-environmental challenge like wildfire what you're talking about is if you want to get on top of that problem you're gonna to have to change every aspect of how you deal with that problem and so it's not just a science project um, you're gonna to have to change business you're gonna to have to change policy you're gonna to have to change management you know the science is gonna to have to be ongoing and it's like well science doesn't do that for the reasons that Jeff said and science is not supposed to be an emotional um, endeavor and and it's you know it's actually specifically designed to not be an emotional endeavor because your results shouldn't matter you know shouldn't depend on how you feel about the, the situation and, and you know, what you want to see you know you sh you're trying to learn something true and deep and real about the world so that's a you know a natural disconnect i mean if you can't connect with people emotionally they're just not going to care about your problem and you're not going to get to the change that you need and so when the national academy of sciences paper um spearheaded by Jerry Shuvel came out about the future of field stations in, in the, and marine labs in the 21st century. It was a clarion call for us. It was like, oh, this is great. This finally gives us like the credibility, you know, to say, look, the National Academy of Sciences says we should be doing things differently. It's not Jeff and Farthen in this little field station this year is saying we should be doing, th doing things differently. So it was, it was impactful and it was powerful and it really helped us out. And so we ran with it. And we grabbed it and we ramped up our art program and, and uh, that, you know, in partnership with the Nevada Museum of Art. And so that was a really nice lever. And from that, you know, the vision of the, the Nevada Museum of Art Center for Art and Environment was really, um, really critical to us. I mean, we could have puttered around out here for a long time all by ourselves and not got anything done. But, uh, you know, Bill Fox in particular was really, really helpful. And so you know, what the, the conclusion we came to is that really art is a discovery process, just like science is a discovery process. They just come at it from slightly different perspectives. And if you can combine the two, if you can put artists and scientists together, then you can get to deeper, more profound discovery because what we see is, as humans is not an objective picture of reality. What we see is a composite of our expectations and our, our experience of the past. So if you have two people from completely different backgrounds and completely different expertise, an artist and a scientist, they are literally going to see things differently. They're going to see different things when they wander around out here in the forest. And you know, there are plenty of great examples through history of artists who've made discoveries that, that in, influenced and provided tools for science. And so that's what we really wanted to do is uh, create an opportunity for for the uh, the discovery process of art to um, to uh, 
align with the discovery process of science here in order to, to make both of them more powerful. And the center's primary task is uh, to collect archives from artists working around the world, expressing different kinds of creative interactions with their environments, with humans' environments. We like extreme environments uh, and projects that happen outdoors because that's where human cognition struggles the most to change space into place. And that is a, a, a primary cognitive function of how we, how we make where we live. And we're very interested in that and have books to support it. And we bring scholars together to look at all these materials and from that they uh, generate knowledge. So um, like a, a field station that collects data and that gets turned into knowledge through papers and so forth. We kind of do the same thing, but in the arts. Um, Jeff started out by talking and describing um, how Seichen is a place, where it is and, and then what it is, and, and how the, the collection of science data was given to the forest uh, people to learn how to manage things better. So it's, uh, you know, it's basically uh, a science endeavor that, unlike looking at, say, string theory, this is art, uh, science rather, that walks on the world, and the art that we collect at the center tends to be that too. It is art that is made by artists who really care about how we function on the planet, and they want the art to express uh, and encourage healthy development you know, in society as a whole regarding our environments. Farthen and Jeff start to look around and collect artists, and they're also kind enough to say, Bill, if you have ideas about people, it'd be interesting to have them up here, who would be good workers, to deal with place, to create empathy for place. And so again, this is art that walks in the world. It's art that has an effect. And so, we said, well, sure, we know these, we know a bunch of people like that. So, for example, there's a, a, a painter and performance artist named Cedra Wood. And um, Cedra goes to a place, collects local materials, makes something, integrates that material with her own body, and then does a performance that is about the place, and that embodies the place in some way. Um, a, a good example is she's on a ship going to the Arctic, and she has her hair, which was then down to the floor. She had her hair woven into the ship's rigging, had herself lifted up, hoisted up into the ship, and she becomes part of that ship. She, the artist, then is she of the ship as they're going through the, um, through in Spitsbergen, and they're going by these beautiful glacial faces and so forth. For Sage Chan, um, she and her partner, Christopher Baldwin, came and, and basically overwintered at Sage Chan, and um, she collected uh, pine cones and took the scales off the pine cones and sewed them together into a cloak. Um, and as is often with her cases, I mean, you can imagine being hoisted up into the ship's rigging. That's a little painful on the hair, right? Um, well, she's literally taking her fingers apart and sewing these scales together because they're sharp and they're tough to get a needle through and so forth, pounding a needle with a hammer. Um, but she takes thousands of these scales and makes a cloak and then she wears the cloak into the forest and she becomes an embodiment of a spirit of the forest. And she's walking through the forest as it's burning. It's a controlled burn. Um, it's small diameter timber that's been cleared out to clean the forest, to keep the big trees, to keep it healthy. Um, and taking out this kind of underlying monoculture uh, of trees that were planted after a forest fire a long time ago. And she becomes the spirit of that fire in the forest. And you can see in her painting how the path behind her is green. The burning has regenerated or starting to regenerate the forest. So um, Christopher Baldwin, her partner, is an internationally renowned comic artist uh, and graphic novelist. And he, um, he's been making comics about the science reports and about the nature of Sage Han. And again, these are featured in the exhibition. Um, and these are things that we collect. So we, we, we're collecting the archives from all of these activities that are conducted by artists at Sage Han. Um, Stuart Ian Frost is a, uh, an Englishman who's uh, moved to Norway years and years ago, teaches art there. Um, and goes around the world making things out of primarily dead trees, um, usually timber that's down, or trees that are, uh, have been uh, taken down or fallen down. And he injects them with geometric pattern of one kind or another. And, and uh, so he gets steward over here with help from uh, his school and the Norwegian uh, government, the arts people. And um, Jeff has been describing to, to Stuart uh, how basically this forest that was replanted after a big fire. Um, it's, it's almost like it's a cloned forest. It's all the same species, they're the same age. Uh, and so they're very prone to catastrophic fires because 
if the conditions are just right and one tree goes, boy, the whole forest is going to go. And so Stuart came up with this idea of let's take a tree and instead of slicing it the lengthwise for planks, for lumber, let's section it into these rounds, right? And the rounds are, you know, pretty big. And let's alternate those rounds in two columns. And that's what you saw behind Jeff when he was talking with these two artificially created trees, these clone trees uh, in, in metaphor. And, um, and so you drive down the road going towards the station, towards the buildings, and you look off and you're looking at the trees and you're seeing where the forest has been thinned and the small timber's taken out and places where it's not. And suddenly you turn and you see these two things that are kind of trees. They don't have any, any, any branches and they don't have green on them, but they're clearly tree trunks of some kind and they look both alike and not. And there's this exquisite sculpture. So that's another kind of, of project. And Nate Refke is, a, is an artist who, um, a commercial graphic artist who works for, among other clients, people like Patagonia. And he lives south of Lake Tahoe, not too far away from, from Sage Hen. Um, he's a Native American guy. And he came to be at Sage Hen to take Native American symbols that were appropriate to use and hide them in a way throughout Sage Hen, so in the creek and near big rocks and up in a grove of trees and provided a, a rough map so you could go find these things. And what he's done, so while, while uh, Stuart is showing how we're slicing and dicing nature, right, um, here what Nate is doing is saying, I want you to come explore this place and I want you to see if you can find these things. And I want you to sit and if you find a stone with a, you know, with a, a geometric figure carved on it, I want you to contemplate what that means and contemplate the fact that you're in a forest and you came and found it and what that means. So, and then I'll end with one last kind of example of a project, uh, Sonia Henriksen, um, who uh, lives in the Bay Area and um, loves to walk in snow. And um, perhaps natural for a person with a Scandinavian heritage, um, but she likes to put on snowshoes and go out into the, into the woods in winter and make a pattern to make a, a figure of some kind, a drawing in snow. Well, now she does that, but at scale. So it takes a community to create these drawings. People have to show up en masse and they have to have snowshoes and they have to follow the rough idea of a pattern that Sonia has. She doesn't tell them exactly where to go, but she says, do this action over and over again and you, you're going to end up with a beautiful pattern. And let's do this in a meadow. And we can put a drone up above and we can actually show you at the end of a drawing done in say, in winter, right? So you understand that the, you're extending your notion of what the cycle of life is in this place. Um, that was a wonderful project because people in the nearby town of Truckee, which is the sort of the home community for say, Chen, um, the people who, uh, you know, might have once shrugged when they heard about the work that was being done at say, Chen, they were invited to come out to the station and walk in those meadows and make that drawing. And they suddenly had a completely different relationship with Seichen. And it gives an opportunity, all of these activities give opportunities for conversations to happen where you begin to realize like, oh, I live in Truckee and I'm in the same forest that Seichen is in. And if Seichen burns, that's not good for Truckee because that's like the fire can come here. Everybody begins to understand this web of connections. And the web of connections, it's not only from place to place, and not from artist to artist, but also, also from science to art. So I guess in my terms, what I'm interested in and what that museum is interested in is, in the Center for Art and Environment, is um, what does it take to, for you to know science and what does it take for you to know art? How are those two things linked together? And if you know, um, if you know the tension in tromping out a pattern in snow and making something that looks like not exactly a snowflake, but it's something that is natural almost in appearance, even though it's highly geometric. Then you begin to understand how a forest itself is put together a little bit. You, you understand something that you didn't know before. So um, again, we collect all those archives so that this, this knowledge that has been created um, is anchored to a place. You care about the place because you've been out there working on an art project or you've gone and taken your children to see those clone trees or whatever it is that you're doing through the arts, right? you now have a connection that is walking in the world because you're talking to your legislators and your representatives at all different levels of government. And you're saying, no, this first stuff is really important, right? And, and if, we didn't, if we didn't have scientists up there working, we wouldn't understand how to, how to save this situation.
talk about another piece, The Invisible Barn, um, which was one of the early pieces that we, we went after um, in the art program. Invisible Barn was a design that was submitted to uh, a contest that happens every year in New York City. But basically, it's a partnership between the Architecture League of New York and the Socrates Sculpture Park, and it's to design a folly, an architectural folly. So this contest has a $5,000 budget, and you submit your design, and if you win, then they build your piece in Socrates Park for in New York City for a year. It gets to be there. So there was a piece a few years back called Invisible Barn that was submitted for that contest, and it didn't win, but it went viral. And it's a beautiful piece. It's a, a mirrored structure um, with uh, pass-throughs where the windows and doors used to be. Um, and it's an elongated cabin. It looks like it was designed for Sage, and it looks like one of our simple little cabins out here. But the surface is completely uh, mirrored. So you're looking through it, and it's reflecting the forest back at you. It really struck me as something that um, commented on our, our buildings and on, on our situation in the forest. And so I got in touch with the folks and asked them, you know, what they were going to do since they didn't win. And I said, we don't know. Um, so uh, I su suggested that they build the thing at Seichen. And so after a bunch of discussion and work, we, that's what happened. And so that piece was really, really fascinating because what happened was as soon as we announced it was coming, people started freaking out. I said, oh, you're going to kill birds. You know, they're going to slam into these mirrors. And, uh, you know, I mean, it's a valid point, right? Bird, coll bird glass collisions are the second leading cause of death for migratory birds behind habitat loss. So it's a huge problem. But you know what? In the, what, 20 years that we've been here, nobody has ever commented on the windows or the buildings here. It's just taken for granted. And these windows occasionally kill birds, you know, because they are window glass. Um, so just the fact that this was an artwork made people think about these issues differently and triggered different thought and um, different ways of asking questions about what we're doing in the forest and why we're doing it and what we should be doing and, and, and uh, the directions we should be going that, that you know, the people weren't asking these questions based on the science that we had and the, and the fact that we were here. So we did do some preliminary work to make sure that we weren't creating a huge problem. <laughs> um, uh, we prepared a white paper on bird glass collisions and realized that um, birds can see UV light and some metals, including aluminum, will reflect UV light in the band that birds can see, whereas window glass does not. So we built the structure out of um, reflectivized mylar, which is aluminum. So the birds can see it. It's like a big glowing flower or something, I suppose. I don't know really what it looks like to a bird, but the fact is that they can see it. Um, so that was a, a great opportunity because the architect um, was unfamiliar with this issue. So this is an architect who's working in New York. Uh, Building high-rises, out of glass. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, they're making smaller projects, but they were not, uh, you know, they really weren't familiar with this issue in any, any deep way. And so it triggered conversations um, in, in their firm. And uh, he did presentations throughout uh, this area on the Invisible Barn where he could talk about this issue. So... You know, this, this art project had some real, it walked in the world, as Bill says, you know, it had some impact um, on the way we do things and on the way that uh, we think about these problems. So I think that was a, a great example of, of an art project that was doing exactly what we wanted art to do for us here. And then one of the other challenges is, you know, we, we tend to work collaboratively here because, A, we don't have any resources. <laughs> and these days, nobody has the resources they need to do what they're supposed to be doing. So we figured out quickly that if we were to succeed, we were going to be needing to bring together a very broad group of people that were concerned about the same thing. Um, and that was wonderful. But, you know, we ended up working with all these agencies, federal agencies, state agencies, you know, nonprofits, concerned private citizens. Um, and what was missing when you talk to them is the you, you mentioned ART, and it's like a four-letter word. But we were able to convince them to at least think about it. Um, and over time, they now see, at least the partners that we work with, the power of engaging with these different ways of sharing what you're doing. Now, from our perspective, you know, when we first started talking to scientists about working with artists, you know, the scientists would go, oh yeah, that's great. They can draw a picture of my, my bird, which, just wonderful. I mean, that's illustration. <laughs> but we're worried about and wanting to engage with artists who are thinking about change and doing things differently that will enable us to reach better conclusions and maybe even make better decisions. 
And that part has been really powerful, I think. Yeah, um, Jeff was even able to convince uh, a collaborative group that he works with um, who's doing forest work in Lake Tahoe to embed an artist in their planning process. So Todd Gillens has been working with them for the last, what, three years? Three years, yeah. yeah three years, helping them understand the social issues around the decisions they're making. And it's been really fascinating. Um, one of the artworks that he, uh, he did for them uh, was, uh, well, it was like, um, a graphic that represented a tree ring that was embedded on the pavement and he could lay them out in the pattern of a healthy forest or a non-healthy forest but these rings had quotations in them so just he said the discussions about the uh, you know just coming to to agreement on what they should be saying in those rings and which poetry they should use and which quotations was um, a really deep process for them it really got into some some discussions that changed the way the the, the group was thinking about the decisions they were making so yeah, which is exciting, actually, yeah. you know, that we are making, we are having a small effect on shift. Um, and that's how things start. Once you get a, once you start moving the ship a little teeny bit, then it starts to gain momentum and shifting the direction. Um, and that, for me, has been just really, really, really exciting and professionally really rewarding. Yeah, it's yeah. one of the best things we do. Yeah, by mm -hmm. far. <laughs> Well, the, the, the thing about SAGEHAM and its residency program um, is that it's a very informal process uh, in terms of how it actually happens. Um, unlike, so your standard artist residency program, um, you know, someone has left a house or a property to posterity to a nonprofit organization and said, invite artists and writers to come here and, um, and talk about the place or just make their work, right? So a lot of residencies uh, and the really famous ones like McDowell or whatever, uh, you know, people come, a novelist will come and she'll just uh, write the novel she's working on. It's not really anchored to that place or about that place. And what a wonderful and award-winning books have been written under those circumstances. Well, at Sage Hand, it's a little bit different because we, we really do try to pick good artists who are going to respond to a circumstance that is specific to a place and use the materials of that place as say Cedra did, or to talk about the work produced at that place as Christopher does. Um, so it's a very, very specific thing. And, and it's not an open process where we just open our arms and say, hey, everybody apply and let's see what happens, you know? We provide a place, you know, you, you can come to this place. It means that the artists then attracted to us are artists who are interested in the same things we are. So we don't have to do a sort of a filtering process. We're getting folks who, are, who resonate with the same stuff that, that we do. It's place-based. And But the other thing that we do is, is we don't want artists to regurgitate our story. Yeah. We, we, we want to expose them to information, knowledge, and then allow them to interpret that and share that in their way. Um, because people get bombarded with one perspective or maybe two different perspectives. And we think people are, if they, they choose to engage, can make pretty good decisions if they have some choices. Um, and that, I think, is also one of the powers from the way that we've been engaging with arts and science is that we let them do their thing. Um, sometimes the artist will turn it back on the science and it's, it's an interesting process. You know, you don't try to steer the art, you just let it go where it wants to go and sometimes it's surprising. So in one case, uh, an artist named Mary Grace Tate, who was in the Master of Fine Arts program at Sierra Nevada College. Um, but anyway, Mary Grace took our fish house and their fish house is an interesting structure. It's a building that you walk downstairs and, and there are three eight foot glass windows that are built into the side of the creek in Sage Hand Creek. And so much of what we know about brook trout behavior was learned in this building because you can go down there and film and watch behavior and see them spawn and see how they aggregate and, and space themselves. So um, it's been a, a, you know, a really productive scientific facility, but she looked at it and thought, huh, okay, so there are people watching the fish here. Maybe this is actually better looked at as a place where fish watch people. So she turned the inside of the fish house into a living room and she made interpretive signs that face out. So when you're in the fish house, <laughs> they're positioned so the fish can read them and learn about the people that they see inside this, uh, this building. And it's full of just ridiculous facts. I mean, she, she said things like, um, oh, humans share 50% of their DNA with bananas, you know, which is great. It tells you something about life. It doesn't tell you anything at all about people, right? Um, and, uh, you know, just silly things like 
she had little images of people carrying chihuahuas in their purse and just ludicrous facts about humans <laughs> that, <laughs> that uh, were really funny. But the effect of the whole thing, you know, was very tongue in cheek and very entertaining, but it also made you really question if what we think we know about fish is really the important stuff to know about fish. And so it was, it was a, a brilliant piece. I thought it was genius. So we were talking about the NAS report. It was kind of your idea to bring the National Academies in to think about free field stations and marine labs. Um, and, and I think you were key in both creating- Well, it was, it, was, it was actually Wingfield's idea when he was AD. Um, we had, it was my idea to do the previous report that was the self-study that was uh, done by Ian and Ivar. Yeah, okay. with OBMS. Um, and that, that was uh, so successful that Wingfield actually wanted to ride on that and, and do an academy study. Because at the time, he had, he had been, I think, the director of the, the uh, California Reserve System. Um, so I can't take credit for the idea, but I will take credit for making sure that they um, integrated that study with what had come out of Ian and Ivar's uh, self-study, which I thought was a really good uh, complementary uh, sequence. It's, it's been really powerful for us. I mean, it really gave us permission to do some of this crazy stuff. I mean, we had sort of started poking around the art world. And One of the things that I think is, is really valuable about field stations is that they are they're a nexus for translating science into uh, a whole host of things, whether it's land management or public education or whatever. And so I, I think, you know, this process is just one, one more example of that function that goes on at field stations and marine labs where, um, you know, science can get turned into a medium that reaches people that otherwise would never, uh, never be reached by the conventional products that, that we produce. So I, I think it's consistent with the field station mission, in my opinion. There's a long history of, of involvement with artists and exploration. And, uh, and I was one of the NSF writers who went down to the ice um, uh, and wrote a book about the art history of the Antarctic, which is an odd thing, but a, a lovely book to do. Um, and still, I'm, I'm still involved with, uh, with art programs and the, and the Antarctic around the world, uh, much to my pleasure and, and to the delight of the museum uh, to bring those materials that are produced by artists at different field stations on the ice uh, to bring those and archive them and show them to the public. The, the reason that the, um, that the military powers of Europe took artists with them to uh, the New World, for example, or uh, Captain Cook sailing around the Pacific, is how do, you, how do you know what's out there unless you can picture it, unless you can image it? And, and, and that imaging extends from maps so that you can actually get back to where you just came from, um, to uh, strategic drawings that show you what the depth of an anchorage is and what the size of native watercraft are so you know what you're going to encounter when you go to these places. Um, that history leads directly into the NSF uh, polar program and the history of putting artists with scientists uh, out on the ice is one that plays well into NSF's criteria where you have to have a certain kind of public outreach or a certain amount of public outreach. Um, so it seems, to, it seems to serve everyone's purpose well um, but making, making sure that these programs get embedded some way, Peter, with institutional support, um, and so that there's a long arc. Uh, you know, did, Fartham talks about the length of a 70-year data set at SageHen uh, with this deeply sensed environment. Making sure that the art is likewise embedded and has a nice long arc of development is something that we at the, at the Center for Art and Environment are certainly keen about. So. Um, thank you for being part of this process to, to create it and keep it going. Okay, so if we could have everyone turn on their video and their audio. Peter, Bill, Jeff, Farthen, welcome. Uh, this is the voice. I'm so glad that you could be here. Um, it was a, a fantastic uh, presentation. I look forward to uh, digging a little bit deeper in. We've had a really active uh, chat room. Uh, also enjoying the fact that a lot of the artists uh, that were mentioned and that were at the residency uh, were are, are here with us. Um, and so I'm going to invite um, anyone uh, to uh, 
uh, send us questions uh, in the Q and A, uh, and especially the artists. If there's uh, comments that you uh, want to uh, insert into the conversation or questions that you'd like to bring up, I uh, would like for you to be a part of that. Um, so I, I'd like to go ahead and start with a question that kind of uh, comes out of the way that the uh, presentation ended. Bill started talking about. Um, you know, how important it is to sort of sustain this, this type of program, sort of a, an arc of, uh, of time. And uh, I, I'd like to, for us to kind of dig down into that a little bit more. Uh, I mean, Farthen mentioned the 70 year uh, collection of data at the field station. Uh, we, we talked about the, uh, the Harrison's uh, 50 year project. It, it's almost like we're, we're looking at things on more of an earth time scale uh, in some ways than, uh, you know, your, your typical semester or funding cycle. Uh, but I, I'd, li I'd like to see if maybe we could talk a little bit about what the challenges are of thinking about things long term and, and why we need to do that. Um, sort of like how, how do we sustain a program over the length of time? And then also it's like if we when we do that, what what are the qualities we're trying to evaluate? What are what are how do, how do we understand or know impact? Are we trying to collect empirical evidence, and if so, what kind? Uh, and what what motivates us uh, to do this type of program? I'll throw that out for anybody who wants to step through the door. Uh, I'll jump. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Jeff. Okay. Uh, you know. Right now, because of COVID, you know, we're living in a really interesting time because it's change and change happens so painfully slow until something thumps you and forces you to react and respond and pause and think differently. Um, and as a result, you know, we now have an opportunity to shift, make a cultural shift between this scientific and this arts community. Um, and one way that we're probably going to need to do this is um, by inviting different types of people to this conversation. Um, you know, we, we need to have social scientists here. We need to have private arts groups. You know, we need to broaden this conversation. Um, and if we can get it to start resonating and sticking, um, then hopefully we can get it to create this kind of cultural shift that, that I mentioned. You know, we, this, this needs to become the norm and not the exception. Um, and again, it all also boils down to money. You know, we need to have a source of funding, you know, to help keep this alive. And I think that if this thing grows, which I think it will, um, I think then it will show to this much broader group of people that this is actually has value um, and it's worth investing in to keep alive. So, more than 90% of all art created at any one time disappears within 100 years of its making, just statistically. Uh, and it goes away through war and fire and divorce and disease and moths and all sorts of mechanisms. And, and the, muse the mission of a museum, at least as we define it, is to um, take the information that has been the knowledge that has been created by artists at great cost um, to society. I mean, you know, it, the tax forgiveness of nonprofit organizations alone is a, a cost that society pays because it values the arts. So you try and throw that knowledge as far into the future as you can. That's what an archive does. That's what a museum does. And that's why we collect things, right? So that that knowledge can, will be reexamined and it will be changed and it will sometimes be useful to someone a hundred years from now. Um, th there is no better example uh, of this than the work done by the Harrisons, uh, Helen and, and Newton Harrison. Newton is on the on the chat with us this morning, um, you know, to set up projects that measure uh, change over time and be able to present those results, that's something we as a, as a museum committed to. We said, we're going to try and preserve these plots for 50 years at Sagehen. I mean, Jeff and Farthen are retired. We're still working to memorialize these plots physically so people can find them, uh, you know, 50 years from now. And can we look at the change in how the plant ensembles reacted to the, you know, the uh, the change in, in the environment. Sue Spade brought up a, a, a wonderful point and she said, Bill, you know, um, come on, the art's not the, the maps and the, and the poetry that Helen wrote and with Newton and so forth. Um, that's just, those are trace evidences of the actual artwork, which was 
creating the knowledge and setting up the situation where you brought diverse kinds of, of workers, scientists and artists together. Um, well, absolutely. But we, we can't collect that exact thing. So what we do are collect the collateral artworks, I guess is one way to put it, uh, and bring them into the context of other collateral artworks, whether it's by Richard Long, who started his career as an artist in England by walking a path across a meadow, or actually an earlier one even, walking a path through snow. Um, the artwork was the performance, not the picture of the thing or the thing itself. It was the actual performance. So um, all of that needs to be looked at and, and talked about and used in the future, especially during a time when um, science is not universally admired and respected or believed. Um, so this is, a, this is a very big conversation over a very long period of time. Um, and more than just our museum, the Nevada Museum of Art should be engaged in, in supporting these activities documenting them, collecting the stuff, working with science institutions. Another great question we had was, should artists be more like scientists and scientists be more like artists? Should they, should they um, you know, some be, be more uh, polymathic, if you will? I'm not sure that's a word. Um, absolutely. I mean, so if you have a viable, healthy culture, you have artists who understand what scientists are talking about. And you have scientists who play the piano. And all of that works together to promote a, a healthy understanding. So that, that's a, there are artists, Jonathan Keats is a conceptual artist from Milan and, and San Francisco. And he builds thousand year cameras that take exposures that, that take a thousand years and some shorter ones, only a century long. And Jonathan has cameras around Lake Tahoe that are, that are photographing that environment over a millennium. And that's paid for by the arts community and by local citizens. And not, Jonathan's not rich, <laughs> so it's not paid for very well. But um, how, so museums will collect those artifacts, will collect those cameras and the, and the images that they make. And that's a way to, if not, even if the cameras fail and after a thousand years they're gone and you can't find any trace of that activity, just that Jonathan does that provokes us to think in longer term arcs. Thanks, Bill. Uh, Peter, I wonder, I wonder if you could give us a little bit of perspective on uh, time and data collection and you know, what, are we, what are we looking for? Well, you know, NSF funds, uh, you know, research that, that runs on, you know, a whole host of time scales, uh, some of it quite long term. We have a, a program in the Division of Environmental Biology called the Long Term uh, ecological research program which funds 28 some odd sites around the globe doing uh, research for uh, over almost 40 years now um, so so we certainly understand the value of, of long-term uh, research to understand processes that, that cycle over really long long periods of time um, to, to sort of get to the question that I think is being asked about you know how do we sustain these activities um, you know, that's a challenge. That's a challenge for sustaining science itself. Um, and it's one that NSF struggles with. We, you know, have, have limited resources like any federal agency. And we try to balance between uh, funding, you know, new science and new discoveries, as well as uh, investing something that will uh, keep uh, critical, important things going. Um, what we do for field stations is we provide um, improvements to the, to the capital infrastructure, whether it be housing or scientific uh, observation equipment or experimental structures or laboratories or whatever. Um, some of that's quite mundane stuff that just simply accomplishes the, the, the mundane task of getting scientists out into the field in a, in a remote and, and difficult to reach and live in uh, location. Um, and, and a lot of that uh, spills over into what we at NSF call the broader impacts. You know, our, our main function is to, to support uh, research that leads to new discovery and advances all of those downstream things that we talk about in our mission statement like health and prosperity and, and national defense, but we don't directly fund any of those things. Um, we, we rely on that happening through a process called broader impacts where science has uh, impacts on uh, policy and decision making and just general uh, people's livelihood um, through a process like what Jeff described at the beginning of this video where we rely on, on people that have that insight on how to translate a scientific understanding into some sort of a message that can reach people 
um, that are in the position to make some sort of a decision or change their behavior or, or do something to, to, to better the world using that scientific information um, as, as, uh, as a basis for, for making those decisions. And so that's what we like to see happening with the investments that we make at field stations uh, is um, the, those, those science projects that are supported by other programs at NSF using infrastructure that we provide through the Division of Biological Infrastructure um, are directly engaging at those field stations with people that are involved in the arts and in education and in public policy and conservation and, and, and so on and so forth. So that to, to me is the process by which NSF accomplishes these things. Um, and we do it primarily by investing in science and charging those scientists uh, through the review of their proposals to address not only what will they do in terms of, of advancing science, but what will they do in terms of making uh, an impact in the communities beyond their peer community uh, with the results of their research. Peter, great. Um, I'm, I'm going to go um, on to a question that was, there's actually several questions and uh, Bill, Bill O'Brien's um, question kind of uh, summarizes it. Can you think of specific examples where artists and scientists working together helped each other see things neither could find on their own? I mean, I think there was uh, far than, you know, brought up the, the fish, uh, the fish house uh, exhibit. And I, you know, I thought that that was interesting, uh, just providing a different type of insight. Uh, but I think, you know, there, Bill's looking for sort of specific examples uh, that might have happened e either within the, uh, the field station or, or, or not. Uh, that's, that's a tricky one. I mean, that's the golden standard, right? You want to be able to point to these examples of like, you know, where that where it's a direct line from A to B. And, you know, that that's, that's always a real hard one. We do have a situation where a photographer observed a previously undescribed plant behavior that, um, you know, science had never, never documented that the, the photographer did. So, um, you know, and the, the artist obviously doesn't understand the plant physiology and what's going on, but they noticed a pattern. And now that's available for science to explore and, and figure out this um, this thing that nobody'd ever bothered to uh, to notice before. So you know that's that's an example. And um, you know I, I think more than anything, it's just about sort of expanding the the um, the, the vision of things. You know, if, if you're uh, working with people who think just like you do, you you never really look outside the box, right? Um, when you're working with people who are saying you know, the world in a very different way and, and um, focusing on aspects of the world that, that you're not, then I think that really expands your thinking. And, and the example that we gave of Todd Gillens um, being embedded in that management and policy project for forestry around Lake Tahoe is a good one, I think, because it's been sort of a frustrating um, experience, I think, for the, the group, because it, it does tend to slow things down a little bit and, you know, make you go back and look at things that you would have just glossed over and gone to the next thing. But the process has been really valuable and, and made, made these people who are creating this policy and creating these management prescriptions think more deeply and, and more profoundly about what they're doing and how, it, how it's going to affect audiences that are not um, generally part of that conversation. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think we can point to some specific examples, but I think that it's more of sort of just a generic um, situation where the more people you bring into the mix, the better off you are, right? I mean, the more minds you have working on these problems. You know, I, I, th I think your example of uh, the photographer photographing the plant is, is, is really interesting because, you know, we, we ask those questions and we're sort of expecting these sort of landmark big discoveries. And oftentimes it's, it's about the process. And then what you described is just you know, it may not be that something that's going to uh, make the headlines, but it, it, it can become an important tool in that sort of interface and how the sort of the artists and, and, and sci or just people from different disciplines are, are providing a different uh, perspective. Bill, yeah, did, you look like you're about, to, I'm sorry, farther if you want to get into that Bill. I mean, I will add that the plant that was observed was a dandelion. So this is one of the most familiar plants that we have on the planet. I mean, more people have probably looked at this, this particular plant than anything else that exists. And usually with scorn and dismay when it pops up in your lawn. But, um, mm -hmm. you know, for, for somebody to spot something new is, is, um, is a, an interesting thing. 
So I also have a, um, a response for Bill O'Brien. Um, the faculty director for Sage Hen is a, is a person by the name of Rob Rue, Robert Rue, and he's a, an atmospheric chemist. Um, and we're working with another artist, this Jonathan Keats that uh, Bill mentioned. And Jonathan wants to do something where you could let the forest vote. Um, yeah, he feels the plants have been disenfranchised <laughs> despite being the bulk of the biomass on the planet. And so we haven't been treating them very well as overlords. So. So, so we know that when plants get stressed, they release certain chemicals into the atmosphere. And we also know that for sage hen, which is on the east side of Sierra, so it's mixed conifer east side pine as its forest makeup, um, that, that the bark beetles that attack these things have cued in on that smell or that chemical um, to identify the weak trees because it's the weak ones that are releasing this chemical. And so the idea was, is it possible to measure that? So we connected Jonathan with Rob um, and they're trying to figure out how can you do that? You know, so it's, it's a challenge, but here, here's an example of where working with an artist, um, we were able to then connect them with a scientist that helped the scientists think, wow, we could probably do that. And if so, um, you could install these sensors um, and then you could basically measure the stress of, on, the, on the forest. Yeah, which or which the Jonathan ecosystem. interprets as a vote. So he calls this um, uh, phyto democracy. <laughs> so the plants are voting for or against the current management regime based on you know, whether they're stressed or not stressed. So, so he's, he's really funny. He, you know, he's talking about bioethics, really, and, and you know, how you can give these ecosystems <laughs> more agency. And it, he's brilliant. He's but, really funny. but from a practical, you know, perspective, you know, from a land management perspective, um, you know, we're, we have a huge forest project going on at Sage Hen. You know, we're restructuring the bejesus out of that place. Well, um, and creating new prescriptions, creating new prescriptions that we think are going to make the system stronger. Um, but how do you measure that? You know, it's kind of like, how do we measure the value of an art science pro, you know, program? You know, it's that weird. But if there was a way to actually measure the stress level of the system, and if what you've done have released it, then at least it might give you a little bit of confidence that maybe you're moving things in a better direction versus leaving them as they are, which is already unhealthy, or moving them the opposite direction from where you intend to go. Yeah, and you know, when, when Jonathan starts talking about, you know, giving plants the vote, you know, you get the the eye roll, the Calif you know, the California response. <laughs> oh, okay, look what, what the hippies are doing now. But but it's uh, it's really just a, a great way of, of changing and shifting the problem so you see it and you think about it the way that Invisible Barn shifted the problem and made you see this invisible thing that you weren't thinking about before. So, you know, it, sure, it sounds flaky to, you know, let's let plants vote for how to manage the forest. But when you think about it, you know, the entire economy and the livelihood and the, 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 the homes and jobs of the people who are embedded now living in the forest depend on a healthy forest. And so, you know, it's absolutely critical to them, you know, and, and if you can find these ways, if artists can find these ways of, of turning things on their ear, um, I think it's, you know, it's, it's all for the good. It's, it's really about people. It's not about the trees at all, right? Bill, did you have something that you wanted to say a moment ago? Yeah, yeah, sure. So um, um, I'm currently engaged in, in writing what has turned out to be, much to my surprise, an art history of the Alps. Um, it's called The Invention of the Vertical, and it's about, I mean, I've mostly written books about and collected the art from artists who are working in big, horizontal, empty spaces. Well, here I am trying to do something with the vertical world. And um, and it's a well-known story that the Mer de Glace on the Mont Blanc Massif has been uh, imaged, um, drawn, painted, and then photographed from the late 1600s. Um, and that kind of reaches an apogee in the, in the mid 1800s uh, with the advent of, of British tourists primarily and other European tourists coming to, to look at the glacier. And um, it's the most popular glacier in the world. And it's been imaged more, I think, than any other glacier I can think of. And now there are scientists who for decades have been looking at those images and comparing them with the current state of the glacier, which is shrinking dramatically. Um, and there's an entire book about that that presents um, the artworks, the mapping works, 
the scientific studies, and it's the most compelling argument for climate change you can imagine. Again, the scientists can, can, um, can bring us all of the knowledge that they have about, yeah, well, the, you know, the glacier's 500 feet lower than it used to be, and it's miles back up the mountain now, and all these different changes. But um, it's the pictures created by the artists that make people want to go see that. So they look at a glacier and they go like, wow, that's awe-inspiring, or oh, that's sad. I mean, there's a whole era now of ecotourism that is devoted to um, people going to look at things that are disappearing, ice around the world being one of them. So um, whether that, you know, artists are now, and Diane Burko, you're with us, you've been looking at this for, you know, for years. Um, you go to Greenland because the, the ice cap on Greenland is not going to exist forever. It's already, they say, they think over the tipping point. You can't stop, it's disappearing. So um, those images are made by artists. That's why the National Science Foundation um, had an artist uh, uh, and writer's Antarctic program. I'm not, that program is in some question right now because it's being re-examined. But um, you take artists with you where you go and artists tell stories and then make dances about it. There's a wonderful project with a, a choreographer who has been working with a scientist at McMurdo studying krill um, and she, turns the krill into uh, the way they function in water into choreographed um, drawings and short films. And, you know, the scientist is going like, oh, I haven't seen that before. Or, oh, I didn't notice, to go back to what, you know, Jeff and Farther are talking about, I didn't notice that pattern before. So above all, human beings are pattern recognition driven. And, um, and artists, part of our job is to reveal those patterns over time, especially. So um, Bill, Nice to see you, so to speak. Um, yeah, we could probably dig up some more some more uh, examples for you. Yeah, you know, but you're you're talking a lot about uh, the visual artists, and it kind of leads to another question that just came in: uh, Are poets or other creative uh, writers, creative nonfiction? And I'd also extend the question to sort of other disciplines: Are they eligible to participate in the residency? Um, you know, I, I, it's also one of those things where, like, as exemplified by many of the artists that you brought in, I mean, uh, the Harrisons are poets as well. So it's, it's really hard to, to think of artists as just simply fitting within disciplinary categories. Uh, but, you know, I would like to, to ask that question about other types of people that have been engaged or might be engaged uh, at the residency. Um, yeah. I think Bill did a great job curating this exhibit because he, he uh, specifically chose a bunch of projects that are very different. I mean, from architecture to uh, performance to, to um, you know, visual media. So medium, um, <laughs> we just had that argument last night, medium, medium. <laughs> anyway, but uh, I think, um, yeah, we're, I mean, we're very flexible. We have had other, another, you know, other poets. One was really interesting. So one of the artists in the catalog is Barbara Foster, who, who does prints, um, printmaking. But what she does is she straps planks to her feet and walks through the landscape and, cre and creates her, her plates that way. So what her prints end up being is a, this record of, of time spent in a landscape, which is really fascinating. But her partner um, also tracks her movements through the forest when she's preparing these plates and then uses this interesting system that assigns three words to every point on the planet. And so he writes poetry based on the path that she takes through the, the forest and these three words that, um, you know, that, that represent the points that she passes through. So that, that was a really fascinating project, I thought. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, we're open to anything. It's not, it's, it's, it's like the science that happens at the field station. We don't tell people what to do, we just facilitate it. Um, you know, we tell them what they can't do occasionally, you know, <laughs> like Newton can't light a match in the forest, which was one of the earliest suggestions and, and, you know, but now we've actually, we've got people lighting forest fires in the forest now. And there, there are other artists who are working on, um, you know, uh, the issue of this woody debris that's in the forest and it's ca causing this problem because we've excluded fire for so long. So one of our artists, uh, does this project called Culture of Fire, and Shannon O'Hare visualizes this, this woody debris um, in the forest, these dead trees and branches and things that fall down and usually get recycled by, by low intensity fire in a, you know, a, a healthier regime um, as 
fire sprites. So these are little, like little spirits that are trapped in the wood and they need the fire to come release them. And so they, he takes wood that we've you know, piled in the forest for burning since we can't, we've got no other use for it and uh, takes it down and gives it to cool kids and they create these fire sprites and bring them up and we burn them and release them and, and capture that with video. So that's a really cool project. Can I ask, just answer a couple of questions um, live sure. real quick? So sure, one of the Jeff. questions is, um, what's going to happen to the art program at Sage Hen now that Farther and I are retired? Well, we've, we've retired and we've only run away from the unfun part. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we've uh, volunteered to stay on as co-directors of the Sage Hen Art and Artists in Residency Program. So we'll still be going there because it was a, it's a project that has no financial support from the university. Um, they just gave us a lot of latitude when we were working for them. Yeah. Um, and then, so if somebody wanted to get, an artist wanted to get involved with Sage Hen, the best thing for them to do would be to reach out to us. And so we're, I don't know how that would happen, but we're, I'm A-M-A-V-A-S-S at gmail.com and farther than is F-A-E-R-T-H-E-N at gmail.com. Um, or yeah, Bill. Yeah, yeah, or Bill. Just reach out to us and we can kind of help get you plugged in. Yeah. If, if, if you're okay, since you actually just said it online, uh, I'll ask Alana to put your uh, emails in the uh, in the chat feature. That way it'll it'll go out okay. uh, for, for people as well. Yeah, um, to another question, I, I mean, I will say that, you know, Sage Hen isn't the only place. I yep. mean, a lot of field stations are interested in art and science. And so the Organization of Biological Field Stations actually has a committee, the Art Site Converge Committee, that started... Um, you know, with the collaboration we did with the University of Alaska Fairbanks and the Nevada Museum of Art and, and uh, uh, you know, Peter provided funding for a planning grant and a, a workshop that we held. And uh, so that, that's a group that um, is, is field stations that are very interested in, in this. But I will say that somebody did a study that was really fascinating. Um, they they uh, did an analysis and found that, what was it, like 90% of the people in the United States live within two hours of a field station. So these are a research field station. So these are really low profile places. They never have any funding. They tend to be small, and, you know, limited facilities, but they're there and they're in your community. And if you look, you can find them. And if um, in most cases, you know, they're not gonna come find you, but if you come to them and you, you make a proposal, I, I think, you know, you'd be hard pressed to find a field station that wouldn't be willing to talk to you. So it doesn't have to just be Sage Gen. You, you know, I think uh, one one of the, the I'm trying to consolidate s several questions that I'm seeing, but you know, you just you just mentioned the uh, the issue of of artists working with the issue of forest fires, and I think you uh, both had planned on being outside today, but had mentioned that you couldn't be because of the smoke. Uh, so obviously, that's something that the the field station is uh, looking at, studying, uh, concerned, obviously. Uh, so, but I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about specifically the work that uh, has come out of the field station with regard to uh, forest fires, uh, how uh, the art and artists uh, that have worked with those themes, how, how, you know, what, do they give us any insight either into looking at the science or looking at how we communicate the science? So, you know, Sage Hen is on forest, U.S. Forest Service land. Um, and there's a lot of artists that want to be working with fire um, on the landscape. But, you know, we're, we're talking about these huge agencies and agencies have got rules. Um, and one of the big rules is they don't want anybody on a fire <laughs> for a variety of reasons. So, so we approached them, at least our local forests, and said, hey, you know, we have a lot of artists that we're working with. And, and our local Forest Service folks are super supportive of everything that we're doing. They, they, they get it. I mean, it took a while, but they understand the power of this. And so they said, well, basically, they would need to go through fire training. They would need to get this thing called a red card. Um, and so we said, okay, how do we do that? So we figured it out. And we actually hosted the first red carding for artists and scientists at Sage Hen last November. And, you know, it's basically you take four online classes that are through this federal fire program. And then you have to do this field training. You got to have the right clothes and blah, blah, blah. And red, red carding is the process you go through if you want to be a professional firefighter. If you want to, if you want to yeah, start out as, as one of their crew members. And so we did it. And it was great because okay. it allowed the Forest Service then goes, okay, we get it. 
Um, yeah. So now they're willing. Yeah, and this wasn't so bad having the public involved. So yeah, and so, so, so now they're willing to allow these much larger events to go on or if artists that have been through the red carding and have made a connection with somebody, you know, it's a way, it's a, it's a, it's a way to crack the door open to actually be allowed to be on an active fire, whether it's a, a, a fire that was lit on purpose, what we call a prescribed fire, or if it's a fire that's like going on at near Sage Inn right now, um, you know, that was started by lightning or some other reason. So um, I, I think that's a great start. And the other is there's a lot of scientists that want to be working actively on fire. And so that's why we did this joint program. So we had scientists that participated as well, and they were able to get their gear and their red carding um, and an introduction, which I think was the most important part. Yeah. I mean, that's, you know, that's kind of plays into some of the other questions that are on the board here about Native Americans and how you, uh, how you bring opposing stakeholders to the table. And so, you know, I, we started out at Sage you know, looking at fire, like Jeff described in, in the, the introduction, and one thing we learned along the way is um, you, you kind of just have to bring people together to start talking. Um, you know, when we started, we would sometimes just say, okay, let, let's make a, a program for school kids. We'd make a program for school kids and go to the school district and say, here, we made this for you. Isn't this great? You know, let's do this. And they would sort of shake their heads and say, oh, they're crying out go home, you know, yeah. leave us alone. But once we, we came to them and said, okay, well, talk to us about your needs and see, you know, how can we help? Then we started making, you know, a lot of traction and, and um, uh, you know, making progress because they could say, okay, yeah, you know, a problem we have is our English language learners. You know, we're not getting through the system as fast as they need to go through, you know, can you help us with that? And so we created programming for that. And so, so you know, I, I would say that's kind of, if you want to start doing these things, start looking at the needs in your community, start talking to people about what they need. And so our forestry project was that way, where Jeff basically ringleaded, <laughs> ringled, what, what's the, the grammar for that? Chased. Yeah, chased people <laughs> down, like the, the, the ranger in our, our ranger district, you know, she's, the forest service people were so overloaded and so busy. Somebody emails them that, you know, they're more likely just going to ignore you and blow you off than anything just because they just can't, they don't have the bandwidth, they can't help. So Jeff didn't take that for an answer. He, he would stalk this poor woman. He'd find her at the post office and he'd go to Rotary Club meetings where he knew she'd be. <laughs> so you find her in the grocery store and finally she just said, okay, I give up. Stop, stop stalking me. I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll answer your emails, Jeff, because I know you're just going to hunt me down if I don't. So, but you know, once you can get everybody at the table and start talking about these problems, then we actually got really great success. I mean, this forestry project um, around which much of our art pivots is, is um, fantastic. In fact, this week, the state of California just came out and, and um, proposed Everything that we've been talking about for they 15 actually years. Committed as partnership between the Cal state of California and the U.S. Forest Service for managing California forests pro proactively, um, which, you know, yeah. it's, it's a career long, you know, it's 20 years. So, I, you know, I think this group of artists we've had working on this future forest thing to address these issues from their own perspective um, has helped a lot in getting, you know, the kind of... Um, groundswell of support for a transference of our, our management and policy to something more like the Native Americans were doing, who, you know, we involved in that process too. It's like, you know, wait a minute, okay, this just makes sense. They, they managed the forest for 13,000 years and never had a problem, and we showed up for 200 years and everything's in the toilet. So, you know, just going back to those previous management strategies just makes sense. And so I think there's a lot more respect for those traditions than there used to be. And, and you know, we try to actively engage in so far as we're capable, so. But you've also got to be proactive. You yeah, know, if you just yeah. sit there and wait for somebody to knock at your door, never gonna happen. you're just going to be sitting there waiting for somebody to knock at your door. Um, so what we did was we identified the people that we, that we thought were the players. Um, and we identified scientists that we thought were near the top of the game. Um, and we reached out to all of them um, and we brought them together and we've had a lot of success with that. And, you know, as we started working with this other community, this arts community, um, we brought them into the mix. And, you know, it's like everything, you know, you start out with the no um, and then you be persistent and, you know, the no s starts to soften. Um, and then ultimately a lot, a lot you get to the resistance yes. was that 
I mean, loggers and environmentalists have been at each other's throats for 40 years, right? And, you know, you, when you start talking about these things, nobody thinks you're going to be able to break through. They just don't think anything's going to happen. And the, one of the, the community that we're in, Truckee, is, is remarkable, I have to say, because they are willing to sit down, even when they don't think it's going to work. They'll still come to the table. They'll still waste their time with you, which is great. So I think that's why we were able to find a result that worked for the environmentalists and worked for the loggers and worked for the wildlife people and everybody in between. I mean, everybody got what they wanted. It was fantastic. So, you know, I think believe in the process and realize it's going to take a, a whole lot longer than you want it to. And, um, you know, find the people. One thing Jeff did that was so strategic and so great was, you know, specifically sought out the people who were going to be the problem, you know, if, find the people who are going to sue you, find the people who are going to hate what you're doing and make sure they're involved. And so I, I, I want to just pause for a moment because uh, Peter, you, you just uh, listed a, a website where people could go and find field stations and marine labs uh, near you. Is there, is there anything that you'd like to add about that? That just seems like a, a wonderful resource for the National Association of Marine Lab Laboratories and the Organization of Biological Field Stations. Well, there was a question which I think Farthen answered um, mm -hmm. about whether there's a, a network of people doing this, and, and yes, there is. There, there's a network of, of these facilities. There's two networks, really, one focusing on uh, what we call field stations, most of which are terrestrial, and then another network that's focusing more on uh, marine uh, lab facilities. Um, and, and the two are very complementary organizations, and, and many facilities belong to both. Um, they both have annual meetings, uh, and, and I attend uh, a lot of those annual meetings, and at every one of them, there are discussions or presentations or breakout sessions uh, talking about uh, art and science. And so um, to answer the question, are there other facilities doing this? Um, the answers are resounding yes, um, and it's probably growing. Uh, how many of them have an art and residence program? Uh, I, I can't answer, that's a smaller number, but there's art going on at, at all of these. Uh, every year, the Organization of Biological Field Stations uh, hosts an auction, and far and away, the, the biggest selling uh, and most competitively bid on items are always pieces of art that, that show up at, at these uh, auctions. I bought a few myself at tremendous cost. Um, and so it's, it's active across the country and, and really around the globe. Well, you know, I, I, th that's, it's wonderful to know about those networks. Another question came in specifically, is there a formal network of field stations in uh, marine labs that are doing artist residencies. Um, I, I know that there are people that are trying to um, create a network. I know uh, our colleagues from Leonardo, the International Society of Art, Science, and Technology uh, are, are watching this as well and share some information in the chat. Um, but, you know, not, not to uh, assume anything, but I'm, I'm not aware of a national network that is actively trying to uh, build these together. So, so um, please correct me if I'm wrong. But I also want to just ask the question: What would be the benefit of such a network? You know, what what would be the steps that we might take to try to establish a network to share uh, best best practices uh, to you know even contribute to this sort of uh, um, ideal data collecting and and uh, you know I, I think it's it's would be incredible to have a place where we could you know, collect all these stories that uh, Farthen just uh, talked about, you know, the way the, the scientists and, uh, and the artists are informing each other. Um, so network, you know, a network of artist residencies in this area. What do you think? Well, we, I mean, the Art Side Converge Network is, is really probably the, you know, the best example of that, that it's a start and it's it's um bootstrap and it's you know a, a committee of the organization of biological field stations and the national association of marine labs that started in 2014 and started out of a planning grant that peter provided and you know to hold that workshop in reno so oh, peter oh well, i mean the national NSA. science foundation yeah, yeah. um mm -hmm. uh but uh yeah I, you know we have a Google group, we have a you know, Facebook page, we, uh, we try to communicate, we try to work together to get things done. And um, yeah, I mean, there have been some, some successes and we're hoping it'll continue, um, but you know, it's, it's challenging. This is something that people do in their spare time, you know, not. Yeah, we both, you know, both the science world lives in its silo and the art world lives in its silo. And I think what you're talking about, JD, is creating this bridge to connect the two together, um, which, 
is I think worthy and worthwhile. Um, oh, I thought you were going to say it was radical and crazy, but thanks. Radical and crazy. <laughs> I, well, I was going to say, you know, that I, I, I think you, you start to lose the benefit if you create an independent network. I think the connection, when these conversations happen within the context of, of annual science meetings or within the context of the annual OBFS or NAML meetings, you, you keep that connection between the science and, and the art. I, I, and I'd hate to see that. Uh, disappear because from NSF's perspective, that's the value, is the ability to take scientific information, which is largely uninterpretable by the general public and most politicians, and translate that into something that resonates with them. Um, you know, we have a saying in this town in DC that no bill ever passes on its own merits. People vote for something, not necessarily for what it is, but for what it means to them. And, and you have to sort of dig to sort of understand how this piece of information about migratory birds changing in the face of climate change might have some resonance uh, to somebody who's going to make a decision. And I, and I think that connection between the people that are doing that kind of representation and the science uh, that's generating the information that you want represented uh, is, is a valuable link. Peter, I think that's uh, very insightful. I appreciate that comment very much. Bill, did you have uh, something you wanted to add? And I think you may have gone mute, Bill. I did, yeah. I'm okay. trying to keep, there's background noise, so I'm trying to keep that away from us. Um, yeah, the Alliance of, of Artist Communities, um, that's uh, a nonprofit body that, that gets all of the, or as many as possible, of the, of the artist residency programs at different places around the, the country uh, and around the world to chat together, they have an annual meeting and they, um, they've they had us come, Jeff and Farth and, and, and uh, me come and talk about what we do. So there's an existing network of those and integrating our conversation with those is one way of, of at least de-siloizing a little bit um, the arts community from that standpoint. There are residency programs uh, such as Playa uh, in Oregon, um, which actively invite scientists uh, to come participate and spend time. Scientists sometimes just need a little time to reflect and write. Uh, you know, they have they've got lots of data, they gotta do something with it, they're gonna produce a paper. And Ply is an amenable place for scientists to come and hang out with artists while writing a paper. Um, that kind of opportunity is pretty cool. I mean, it doesn't happen often enough. I think it should happen more, but, so there are crossovers that are going on, but checking into the, the network that basically Jeff and Farthan have started to put together is also a really important thing to do. Uh, we're, we're coming up on our, our time to end. Uh, and I, I do want to mention just because uh, Farthan, and it's been brought up a couple of times, uh, the, an idea of a catalog. Uh, and uh, this is an e-catalog uh, that uh, we, we produce together uh, through cultural programs of the National Academy of Sciences for an exhibit that uh, we were supposed to have at the National Academy of Sciences that uh, never actually physically materialized, uh, but we did collectively put together a catalog that contains uh, uh, descriptions and work of the, a lot of the artists that uh, we, we talked about today that have been at Sage Hemp. Um, I, I do, I think it's worth kind of thinking about not only this exhibit, but also, you know, what the impact of, of the, the pandemic has had on all, all of us. I know uh, the, uh, the field station has restrictions, the museums, of course, have restrictions, uh, but it also kind of it goes back to, you know, some of the, the questions that uh, uh, were brought up earlier about, you know, what is the art, what's the artifact? And that was actually one of the questions that we were uh, exploring when we were uh, pulling the materials together for the exhibit is, you know, in a lot of cases, what we were exhibiting, like the maps of the Harrisons, it's not really, you know, the artwork. The artwork in a lot of ways was the, the process of bringing people, uh, you know, from the community to, to do the snowshoe drawing, Sonia, or, uh, so that became sort of the question that's like, you know, how, how do we create a physical exhibit and still sort of talk about uh, these sort of broader, um, areas. And I'm wondering, Bill, if you, if you wouldn't mind just sort of um, talking about a little bit about what does it mean for us to be talking about uh, the exhibit here, not having the exhibit 
uh, after we, I mean, literally we had all of the artifacts in DC ready to go up uh, and we shut the, uh, uh, the well, the, everybody shut DC down, you know, the week before we were supposed to install. So uh, I wonder if Bill, you might kind of reflect on that and, and you know, and what, is, what does it mean to have an exhibit of artifacts as opposed to experiencing uh, the, the work in, in, in the place, you know, the, the artwork that walks in the world as you so elegantly uh, stated. I love exhibitions. I love going to see actual physical <laughs> things, you know. Uh, and that's why I'm, I live the life I live. Um, and Anna McKee was a, an artist um, who went to the Antarctic and went to um, an ice core site and made a tremendous sculpture that basically takes the data and turns it into um, a graph that hangs from the ceiling, a uh, series of hand dyed silk strips. Uh, different colors indicating difficult, different chemical composition of the atmosphere going back 63,000 years, that, that record recorded in the ice. And, um, and it was a primarily an archive exhibition with that one artwork in it, right? Just, and teachers came in and on their own wrote curriculum about that piece. It was so beautiful and the kids liked it so much. And that piece had an incredible impact. And that happened through a physical manifestation of data visually, beautifully in a museum. And that happens at our museum all the time. So um, exhibitions are powerful and, and they are, I believe, necessary um, to actually apprehend the real physical object. On the other hand, my experience with you, JD and Alana, um, running your program at the National Academy is that, look at what's happening right now today. I mean, we can't be at Sagehen because it's dangerous to be there. There's fire all around it. It's smoky as heck. Um, nonetheless, Seichen's alive in this conversation. And there are more than 500 people on this conversation. And, you know, that's happening despite the fact there's no exhibition, um, mainly through your leadership and your smarts about how to put this together. Um, the catalog is a different way. Again, it's not a direct apprehension of the object, but it's a way of representing the objects and the processes um, that underlay the production of those objects, whether the objects are primary or collateral, whatever. So, I, you know, everything's an opportunity. Every challenge opens a door that says walk through. I mean, this is what Jeff and Farthen specialize in. Every challenge is an opportunity, you know, and the, um, every challenge is also a permission to go somewhere else, right? So museums become laboratories of permission sometimes uh, in education, particularly. So, um, you know, like I said, I love an exhibition, but it's possible to transfer the information and the culture that arises from that information. I mean, um, you know, David Robertson was asking this question. Uh, well, okay, scientists produce information. We know what kind of information that is. And we know its relationship to the world without getting too theoretical about it. And um, what does art produce? What's the information that art produces? And I, I think my answer is culture, although David is, himself is better uh, I mean, he taught this for years at UC Davis in the Literature and Environment Program, but um, I really think that it's culture that's being produced. And it, you have to be very careful because you don't want to say, well, we're going to transmit our, our values from generation to generation. That's kind of implicit in that, but that doesn't take an exhibition. That can be achieved through books and it can be achieved online and it can be achieved with conversations over dinner. I mean, all sorts of ways that that gets transmitted through time. And so, you know, JD, you guys are kind of leading part of this conversation in a very powerful way between science and art by producing events like this and the whole Dazer series. So, and the work of Leonardo itself. I mean, that's another beautiful example. So um, I'm going to stop there because I'm just rambling kind of, but um, yeah. Jeff, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Bill. I mean, I, I do think that that's, uh, you know, sharing a little bit of our process of where we got from the original plan to here, I think is, uh, is you know, helpful and informative in a lot of ways. Um, so the e-catalog, uh, Alana has put a link uh, in the chat uh, feature. It, it was also, a link was also emailed out in a reminder. Uh, I, and I'm sure that when we send the survey out, we'll send another link uh, to the catalog in case anyone has missed it. So we really want to share it. It has beautiful essays that Bill and Farthen uh, uh, contributed, and uh, just it, we're going to stand as a documentation of the exhibit that never actually happened. 
uh, but it's still the, the, the research and the work that you all put into this and, and the artists and their contributions. Uh, hopefully this e-catalog e will be a, a, a small way of honoring um, all of that. So um, I, unfortunately, it's time to bring it to a close. Uh, Peter, Bill, Jeff, Farthen, thank you so much uh, for this and everything that you've done leading up to this. Um, we appreciate it and uh, goodbye to everybody around the world that's joining us as well. Yeah, thank you, JD. This has been really great. Thanks for all the work. Yeah, and thanks. the catalog came out so great. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank Bye, you everybody. Bye. <laughs>